Thank you, Father. The word this morning is going to come from Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Hallelujah. 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 Isaiah 43. I'm going to read two verses of scripture. That's verses 18 and 19. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. And the Bible reads Remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This morning I want to preach from the title, Greater is Coming. Greater is coming. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, greater is coming. And it's coming like never before. Oh, that was the wrong neighbor. You need to speak to somebody who's going to receive that in their spirit. Look at somebody else on the other side and say, neighbor, greater is coming. And it's coming like never before. Hallelujah. I wish I had about 10 of y'all who could just accept that in your spirit. When you think about your family, when you think about your finances, when you think about your future, you ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, Greater is coming. And it's coming like never before. Oh, God, give me the strength to go on the street. This morning, as we look at this scripture, it must be pointed out that the children of Israel here at the time of our text are on the fringes of freedom. Their time in Babylonian captivity is coming to an end. In Isaiah chapter 40, they received the prophetic word of the, announcing this release, announcing this deliverance. In Isaiah chapter 40, God commissioned Isaiah to speak to Jerusalem and to cry unto her and tell her that their warfare had been accomplished. Tell her that her iniquity has been pardoned and she has received of the Lord, of the Lord's hands double for her sins. At the time of our text, Isaiah is letting the people of God know the hard times that they've had, the difficult experiences that they faced are getting ready to be put in the rearview mirror of their life. However, what's interesting is as burdensome as being in bondage was, these Israelites are coming out of Babylon better than they went in. As hard as Babylon was, as difficult as Babylon, Babylonian captivity was on them, the adversity of all they had to face, uh, that adversity has caused them, these Israelites, to come out better than when they went in. Listen, I resolved if I'm going to go through pain, if I'm going to go through trouble, if I'm going to go through trial, I at least want to come out better than I went in. I mean, if I have to go through the school of hard knocks, I want to at least graduate a little bit smarter. I at least want to come out with a little bit more wisdom than when I went in. I don't want to go through anything just to be going through it. I don't want to face hard times just to be facing hard times. If I have to have trouble, if I have to face adversity, if I have to have trials and tribulations, if I must face adversity, I at least want to come out better than I was before I went in. It was David in Psalms 119, 71, who declared that it was good that I was afflicted. Because it was in those afflictions that I learned God's status. As David said, I'm glad I had hard times. Because hard times taught me 
about the Lord. I'm glad I had pain because pain taught me how to pray. Where my Bible study people let in, the, in here today? These Israelites are not coming back to their homelands the same way that they left. But when you read this story, you'll see that being in captivity has changed them for the better. In Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14, the Lord has a conversation with Israel prior to them going into captivity. And he prophesies to them. He looks into their future and tells them that by the time you come out of this, by the time you come out of this captivity, things are going to be different with you. Things are going to be different about you. When you look at Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14, and you'll have to read it at your own leisure, you'll see that being in captivity has increased their patience in God. Uh, we know that their patience in God has been increased because in verse 10 of Jeremiah 29, God told them they weren't coming out early. But they would be in captivity for 70 long years. It is during these 70 years of captivity that they have to develop a patience in God. It's in these 70 years that they have to learn how to trust in the Lord with all of their heart and to lean not into their own understanding. It is during these 70 years of hardship, these 70 years of disappointment, it's during these 70 years of captivity that patience is being developed within them. And I have to pause here for a moment just to talk to somebody this morning who can be honest about the situation. You didn't pray for patience. That relationship taught you patience. You didn't ask God for the patience of Job, but that job you was on taught you patience. Uh, you didn't pray for patience, but predicaments and problems taught you how to have some patience. Uh, the Israelites are better, number one, because captivity has increased their patience in God. But not only did it increase their patience in God, but in verse 12 of Jeremiah 29, captivity increased their prayers to God. Huh? Trouble has increased their prayers to God. God told them in verse 12, then you shall call on me and shall go and pray unto me. And, and in that time, I'll answer you. God says, when you come out of captivity, you're going to really know how to talk to me in prayer. When you come through this thing that I've allowed you to go through, you're really going to know how to commune with me. When you come out on the other side of this thing that looks insurmountable, you're going to know how to pray to me. It's almost as if the Bible is inferring that because you had captivity, you pray now on a different level. It's almost as if God was saying, you used to pray, now you lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord, my soul the key. But after you come through this, you're going to know how to talk to me. I got the wrong crowd in here. He is suggesting that your prayer is going to change because it's going to be something that happens to you. It's going to be something that you go through. It's going to be something that you face that's going to make you learn how to pray. It's going to make you get on your knees and talk to me. It's going to make you go in the closet, shut the door, lay on your face and say, God, what is going on in my life? Listen, if you show me somebody who's been through some stuff, I'll show you somebody who knows how to talk to the Lord. If you show me somebody who's gone through the hardships of life, who's drunk tears for water, I'll show you somebody that has a relationship with God through prayer. Captivity changed them. Their patience in God had increased. Their prayers to God had increased. But in verse 13 of Jeremiah 29, their captivity increased their passion for God. In verse 13, the Lord says, you will seek me and find me because you are searching for me with your whole heart. Somebody say your whole heart. The inference the text is making is that before captivity, before trouble, they would come to church to be at church, but not in church. <laughs> yeah, B before captivity, you would come to church because mom and them came and told you to come to church. But after you go through something, you come to church seeking something in church. After captivity, they're coming to church to be in church. And they don't went so far. If, if they have to have church by themselves, they'll have church all by themselves. 
self. Because it's something about going through adversity. It's something about going through trouble that increases your desire for God. It's something about surviving what somebody told you or made you feel was unsurvivable that causes you to seek God with your whole heart. Captivity changed their patience in God. It changed their prayers to God and changed their passion for God, but ultimately it increased their possessions from God. Getting ready to preach in a minute. Coming out of captivity, verse 14 of Jeremiah 29 says, The Lord says, I will gather you all from all the nations, from all the places, whether I've driven you out and I'll bring you again to this place wherein I've caused you to be carried away. Don't miss this church. The Lord is telling them that when the trouble is over, I'm going to give you double for your trouble. The Lord wants them to know that you aren't going through trials and tribulations just to come out empty handed. But God says, I'm going to bless you and restore everything that you lost. That, that's a word for somebody this morning. God getting ready to restore everything that you lost. Everything that it feels like you lost. Every place that it feels like you lost. God, ground. God is getting ready to restore. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, restoration is on the way. It is this last benefit of facing adversity and being in captivity that our scripture and thought is coming from this morning. Because in this scripture, God wants Israel to know that he has a blessing with their name on it. He wants them to know that greater is coming and it's coming like never before. God wants them to know that they are getting ready to be blessed beyond their wildest imaginations. He wants them to know that everything that you went through was for a purpose. He wants them to know that every tear you cried only watered the, the, the ground that I had set up the harvest for you. I don't know who this word is for this morning, but I declare that somebody needs to get in the posture of expectation. Somebody here needs to receive this word in their spirit because God says, I have greater for you and it's coming like never before. I want to take the next few minutes and tell you how this blessing is getting ready to come. I want to take this next few moments to tell somebody how greater is getting ready to hit your life. God says that you need to know what's coming is coming. And it's going to surpass anything you've ever witnessed. I got to preach prophetically here this morning. I got to preach prophetically to somebody. I come to tell you that what's coming is coming. And it's going to surpass anything you've ever witnessed. Don't you miss this. In the text, God is telling Isaiah to tell his people that what's on the way is going to surpass anything that you've ever witnessed. In verse 18, Isaiah says something to the people that must have left them scratching their head. He says, remember... Not the former things. He says, stop considering the things of old because I'm getting ready to do something new. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Forget all of that stuff in the past. Because nothing can be compared to what God is getting ready to do. Because I'm getting ready to do something great in your life. I'm getting ready to do something great in your family. I'm getting ready to do something great. The reason why this had to be something mind-blowing. Because in their past, God had done some great things. In Israel's past, God had done some things for them that were unbelievable. And he had done some things for them that just was unsurmountable. In fact, in verse 14 of our text. God frees them from the bondage of Babylon. He says, I am the God that sent to Babylon and brought down their nobles. God says, I am the God that came to you while you were in captivity and I freed you from bondage. In verse 16, God says, not only that, but I am the God that when you were standing at the Red Sea, I formed a bridge for you to walk over. In verse 17, he says, not only did I form a bridge for you to walk over the Red Sea, but I'm the God that fought your battles. I'm the God that calls Pharaoh's horses and calls Pharaoh's soldiers and calls Pharaoh's chariots to be drowned in the Red Sea. But God says, despite what I've done in the past, you haven't seen nothing yet. I know you had some successes. I know you won some battles, but I come to tell you what God is getting ready to do in your life won't even compare to what God, for what God has already done. God says, with everything you accomplished, with everything you built, 
with all the strides you made. Yes, it was great, but greater's coming. Yes, it was good, but greater is coming. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but there is somebody in the house this morning by your own admission who can testify that God has done some phenomenal things in your life. God has fought some battles. God has formed some bridges. God has took out some enemies. Oh, but I come to tell you that what he's done, it won't even compare to what he's getting ready to do. It's somebody who can testify and say, preacher, God has touched this old body. He's healed this body. He's made crooked roads straight. And I come to tell you, even in the midst of him doing all of that, it still won't compare to what God is getting ready to do in your life. Feel like preaching. God told me to tell you, Carrie, that he has something that's going to surprise your wildest imaginations. I know we've already accomplished a lot. I know we've already seen souls saved. I know that we've already baptized hundreds. I know that we've seen hundreds filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. But God told me to tell you that I'm getting ready to blow your mind. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men what God getting ready to do for us. God says what I'm getting ready to do is going to blow your mind. And I wish I had somebody in here this morning that's not going to wait until he does it. He's not going to wait until he gives it to you. You're not going to wait until you see it. But you'll go ahead and shout now. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, whatever you dreaming, huh? God say he going to surpass it. Whatever you believe in him for, God say he going to surpass it. Whatever you think he getting ready to do, God told me to tell you that he getting ready to surpass it. Hallelujah. God's getting ready to surpass it. Please don't lock God in what he's already done. Please don't limit God by what he's already done. Please don't look at God as if God can't do nothing else. God told me to tell you he's getting ready to blow your mind. He's getting ready to blow your mind. What he's getting ready to do, you won't even see it coming. Text. The text is teaching us that you can't lock God into a past performance. Because with God, the best is always yet to come. You haven't seen the best of God's miracles. You haven't seen the best of God's deliverance. You haven't seen the best of God's provisions. You, God says, I'm doing something greater. If you love the Lord, uh, the Lord has still got some best that's yet to come. I wish I had somebody by faith huh, who would look at three people and say the best is yet to come. Huh, the best is yet to come. Huh, we've had some great times but the best is yet to come. Huh, look at him and tell him I see that vision night. Why? Because the best is yet to come. Oh my God, I can get ready to preach in here. Uh, Pastor Chandra, uh, how uh, is greater coming? Uh, tell me, preacher, uh, how is greater coming? Number one, it's coming surpassing anything that you've ever witnessed. Uh, not only is it coming surpassing anything that you ever witnessed, uh, but secondly, it's coming sooner than anything you ever wanted. Uh, it's coming faster than you can imagine. Uh, it's not only going to surpass anything you've ever witnessed, uh, but the Lord said it's coming sooner uh, than anything you ever wanted. On it. Look at the text in verse number 19. The text says now it shall spring forth. I wish I had a Bible reader in the house this morning. The Bible says now it shall spring forth forth. I know preaching is my job y'all but somebody help me preach this morning and holler now. Ah, oh, when I read the Bible, there are certain words that just tickle my fancy that I come over in Scripture. Certain words that just build up an excitement in my spirit when I'm reading the Scripture. Certain words that cause me to just want to get up and do a dance. It calls me to just throw my head back and holler when I see certain words in Scripture. And there are several words in verse number 19 that just make me want to go crazy. The first word is now. See, can I tell you why now gets me excited. Now gets me excited because it speaks to God's promptness. Now speaks to the fact that God can do it faster than the twinkling of an eye. Now speaks to the fact that it doesn't take God long to do anything because I've discovered that God's now is faster than your next. 
Would you, oh my God, in here. I say, God, now is faster than your next. Some of y'all waiting and praying to be next when God is calling you to be now. Oh my God, I got to get out of here. There is somebody in here this morning that needs to know that God can fix your situation right. Oh my God. God can turn it around right now. God can deliver you right now. God can heal you right now. God can make a way right now. And if God do it right now, if God has the ability to do it right now, my question would be, why are you waiting to give him praise? If God can do it now, you ought to praise him now. If God can turn it now, you ought to praise him now. If God can fix it now, you ought to praise him now. If God can step in now, you ought to give him glory now. There is another word in this scripture that every time I see this word in scripture, I get excited. That word is a now, but that word is shall. Look at somebody and say shall. See, now speaks of the promptness of God, but shall speaks of the promises of God. I wish I had some help in here this morning. Anytime God attaches a shell to your life, it's a done deal. Anytime God puts a shell over your head, it's a done deal. If God says you shall be the head and not the tail, get ready for headship. If God says you shall be the lender and not the borrower, get ready for multiple streams of income. If God says you shall be above and not be beneath, get ready to be afloat. If God says that you shall live and not die, I don't care what was on the x-ray. I don't care what was on the doctor report. You better get ready to live, baby. Live. I'm talking to anybody in the room whose God has ever spoken a shell to you. I feel like preaching this morning. There is another word in this text that gets me, get me excited. It tickles my fancy. It causes me to want to buck and go crazy. Oh, it causes me to want to run around like I've lost my mind. See, now speaks to the promise of God. Shell speaks to the promises of God. But that word spring, spring. Spring speaks to the production of God. That word spring connotes the thought of a plant that suddenly appears. One day it wasn't there, but the next day it's there. A plant that wasn't there is now there. It sprung out of the ground. Can I tell you what the Lord is trying to say? The Lord is saying that there is some things that I'm going to do in your life that's going to just suddenly appear. Listen, as I was in prayer, God gave me a list of 20 things that will happen to anybody, that's, to people that is connected to this ministry this year. I was in prayer at the top of the year praying for you. I was praying for you. I was thanking God for you. I was seeking God for direction for this ministry. And God gave me a list of things that shall spring forth. It shall happen now. It shall shift now. I don't know which one applies to you but I'm going to read the list. When I call the one that hits your spirit when I call the one that confirms what you've been praying for. When I call the one that hits you down in the belly of your excitement I want you to give God praise like you've lost your mind. God says these 20 things are going to happen in this house this year. The debts will be canceled and bills will be paid. Oh my God, marriages will be better. Bodies will be healed. Contracts will be granted. Doors will be open. Tears will be dried. Relationships will be stronger. Peace will be be restored. Joy will be renewed. Doubters will be silent. That was for me. Credit will be established. Businesses will be birthed. Oh my God. Results will be negative. Surgeries will be successful. Tumors will shrink. Yes. Opportunities will be birthed. Children will be saved. The community will take notice. Politicians will ask for advice. And the devil will be defeated. Is there anybody in the room who can say, I'm number nine, I'm number ten, I'm number three. It's going to happen this year. 
getting ready. It's getting ready to hit your house. It's getting ready to hit your family. It's happening now. It's getting ready to spring forth. It's getting ready to show up out of nowhere. Say it. You might as well look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better keep your eyes on me because if you don't, you're going to miss it. If you don't keep watching me, you're going to gonna miss what God getting ready to do in my life because I'm walking today, but I'm going to drive tomorrow. Oh, my God. I'm getting ready. I've got to hurry. I just come to tell you, greater is coming like never before. Greater is coming like never before. Greater, getting ready to surpass your expectations. Greater is getting ready to come quicker than you ever imagined what it took 10 years for others to do. What it took 10 years for others to be. God told me to tell you, it's getting ready to spring forth. It's getting ready to show up out of nowhere. Greater, greater, greater is coming. How is it coming? It's coming and it's going to surpass anything you've ever witnessed. Pastor, how is this coming? It's coming and it's going to happen sooner than you ever wanted. But the text says, now it shall spring forth. But verse 19. Verse 19 lets us know that it's going to come supernaturally above anything you've ever wondered. The Lord says, and I'm done. In verse 19, he says, I'll even make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to make rivers in the desert. God says, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. And then he says, I'm going to make a river in the desert God says that's why I'm going to do it supernatural because if it's supernatural man can't take the credit for it if it's supernatural can't nobody say that it was Pastor Shondrick or Pastor Wright if God does it supernaturally can't nobody say I did this or I did that Oh my God, you know there are some people that you run into that help you once upon a time. And every time you see them, you say, they say, you know, I signed for that. You know, you wouldn't have had that if it wasn't for me. You know, the only reason you got that is because I vouched for you. But there is something that God is getting ready to do that's going to be supernaturally done. Watch this. God says, I'm going to make a driveway in the wilderness. And I'm going to put a waterfall in the desert. And the thing that messed me up, I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Lord, what are you trying to show me? Lord, what are you trying to get me to see? With a with way in the wilderness and a waterfall in the desert the Lord said when was the last time you saw a waterfall in the desert when was the last time you saw a driveway in the wilderness in other words God said I'm getting ready to put blessings where blessings don't belong I'm getting ready to show my strength in places you're not even looking for me Oh, you missed your chance to shout. God says, I'm going to put blessings where blessings aren't even supposed to be. God says, in the areas you think I'm not going to show up, that's where I'm getting ready to show up. That's where I'm getting ready to do it. I'm going to do it in a child that you gave up on. 
I'm going to do it in the area where you stop looking for me. I'm getting ready to come left when you want me to come right. God says, I'm getting ready to blow your mind because I'm getting ready to do this in a way that you least expect. I say, God, that sounds like a paradox. How can you put a driveway in a wilderness? How can you put a waterfall in the desert? I said, Lord, that sounds like a paradox. How can you do it? That sounds paradoxical. And the Lord said, it's in paradox that I'm successful. He said, you got to understand that I specialize in the paradox. In fact, the only reason some of us in the building this morning is because God's divine paradox. God took me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 he said let me show you boy how I operate in paradoxes let me show you preacher how I specialize in paradoxes he says you can be troubled on every side yet not in distress that's a paradox you can be perplexed but not in despair that's a paradox you can be persecuted but not forsaken that's a paradox you can be cast down but not destroyed that's a paradox you can be down to your last down and I'll make you look like a million dollars that's a paradox you can have disease in your body and praise me like your whole that is a paradox I don't know who I'm talking to but the Lord told me to tell you I've got something coming that you never seen if you believe that God has something that you never seen before then you ought to help me give God praise you ought to help me make some noise you ought to help me set an atmosphere if you believe that the Lord has a blessing that you've never seen before then I believe you ought to give him a praise that you never gave him before if you believe that greater is coming and it's coming like never before won't you give God praise like you never gave him before won't you make a sound that you never made before won't you do a dance that you never done before won't you say something you never said before greater 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 is coming. Greater is in my house. Anybody can shout when they come. Anybody can dance when it comes. Anybody can give God praise when it comes. But is there anybody in the room who can say, God, before you do it, I'm going to give you glory. Before you do it, I'm going to give you praise. Before you do it, I'm going to give you the honor. Say it. Say anybody in this room who can shout while you're still broke. Anybody in the room who can dance while you're still sick. Anybody in the room can throw your hands up and say thank you while that child is still acting crazy. Anybody can say, God, I thank you, even though that man still hanging out. I don't have to wait till you do it because I believe that you got enough power. I believe you got enough strength. I believe you got enough anointing. I'll go ahead and give you praise now. I'll go ahead and say thank you now. I'll go ahead and give you glory now. I feel like pre 
wait in the room. Don't wait till the battle is over. Go ahead. Go ahead and shout now. Say it. Greater, 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 greater. It's coming like never before. Greater in your house. Greater in your family. Greater in your mind. Say it. 